Welcome to the Politics of Information webinar series funded by SHRC, organized by the Center for Access to Information and Justice, featuring speakers researching information, data, and power in the digital and pandemic age. The Center for Access to Information and Justice focuses on public interest research and the use of access to information in social science. Please check out the CAGE website. Give us a shout if you'd like to get involved. I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Winnipeg is located on original ancestral lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. I also acknowledge that our water in Winnipeg is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. Thanks to the UW event team and media team for working on the CAGE summer webinar series. Here's our format for today. Uh, our speaker will, will have 45, 50, 55 minutes. Uh, and the co-host and I will ask a few questions. We'll turn it over to the audience for questions. If you're in the audience, you have questions, please pop them into the Q&A tab. But before that, a few important introductions of very special people, I will turn it over to our co-host. Hi everyone, my name is Shana Lajwa. I'm a former student from the University of Winnipeg where I have since moved to Montreal and I'm pursuing law. I'm a queer Métis multidisciplinary artist and I focus on storytelling through moving image where I had the um, privilege of being a mentor with Mawa in Winnipeg and also a mentee with the Toronto Queer Film Festival, um, where I participated in the Berlinale most recently, and I am pursuing a residency with Harvard Collective. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here and for all the work that you do. And now I have the privilege of introducing today's speaker. Andy Conte is a writer and nonfiction filmmaker. His work illustrates intersections between politics, violence, and justice, and has appeared on CBC television, CBC radio, and TV Ontario, among other venues. He is the co-writer and editor of Rubber Stamped, a documentary short examining the legal case of Hassan Diab, and the writer-director of The Echoes of Chloe Cooley, an award-winning short documenting the resistance of one woman who created the first anti-slavery law in the entire British Empire. Uh, Andy is a fellow of the Union Docs Documentary Lab, the Hot Docs Accelerator Program, and the Next Up Leadership Program for Social Justice. He's producing a, a doc film based on the popular prisoner produced cable net 13 weekly show Contact TV, which was on air from 1991 to 1996. And today, uh, Andy will be speaking about archives Freedom of Information and Documentary Film Making. Thanks so much for being here. The floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you very much to now and to everyone at the Center for Access Information and Justice for, for having me today. Uh, my name is Andrea Conte. And for those who may not be able to view a screen at this time for any reason, I'm a white European descended male wearing a bluish t-shirt, speaking to you on a cream colored couch. And I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, also known as the settler name of Toronto and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Uh, I wanna thank, I guess, lead off with all of the teachers who gifted me with the knowledge to share with you today. And although our time together is short, I want, I want to be as interactive as possible. Um, so the title of our conversation, I put as access to information and nonfiction media, but really it's about the relationship between these two systems. And, uh, and, and in this case, I focus on uh, my practice of cinema, film and journalism, which are my main mediums of interest and practice. So I'm gonna share this keynote that I made. Oh wait, I gotta share screen first. Okay. 
share screen. There we go. All right. So I would like to start with a quote by Toni Morrison, because I find that the way that she frames race as a construct of like distraction, right? The, right, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. Hang on, I'm trying to minimize, I'm gonna minimize my zoom here because it's getting in the way. There. It keeps you from doing work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend years proving that you do. Somebody says that your head isn't shaped properly so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Someone says you have no art so you dredge that up. Someone says that you have no kingdom so you dredge that up and none of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. And I think that this is a really great segue to a conversation about you know, informa information systems of the state. Um, so with that, I wanted to uh, lead off uh, on a little bit of my own journey on access to information and how I came to this practice, which was not that long ago. Uh, I, sp I spent a lot of time in Baltimore, Maryland, starting in 2015, where I lived full time. Uh, since COVID, it's been more part time. And it started in the aftermath of the murder of, of Freddie Gray and, and being a part of community organize, organizing efforts that serve people impacted and held captive by, by the prison system in the Crossroads State. And I became aware of a legal case called the Unger decision, or the Unger versus Maryland. And it was a 2012 decision that impacted about 250 people, all of whom were convicted to life sentences and all of whom received illegal and unconstitutional trials prior to 1980. And it was kind of a, loop, a loophole that came up that had to do with a conflict between the Maryland state constitution and the federal constitution uh, because Maryland is a slaver state. And so they've always uh, resisted progressive reform or, or reform from imposed by the federal constitution. So they've tried to govern their courts for over a century by way of their own state rules. Um, so this resulted in, you know, during the 50s, 60s and 70s, a lot of, of I guess, what's called state endorsed jury nullification, which is basically the courts ignoring the, the, the rules, the courts telling the jury not to ignore the rules of the courts. Um, so I have a, a clip to better ex explain this and how I came uh, to, to work with a man by the name of Charles Ford, who served 64 years. Uh, he, he was incarcerated starting in 1952. Uh, so Evan, if you're there, go ahead and roll clip one, please. Hundreds of Maryland families are coping with news they thought they'd never hear. Their loved one's killer could soon be free. A ruling last year by the Maryland Court of Appeals has opened a door for hundreds of inmates who were convicted before 1980 to get new trials. The state's highest court ruled that the way judges used to instruct Maryland juries violated the defendant's due process. It was called the Unger decision. These men, and all but one of them are men, had spent on average 40 years in prison. Charles Edward Ford, who was convicted in Charles County in April of 1952 for the charge of first degree murder, was released last week to a Baltimore nursing home at age 84 after serving the last 64 years of his life in the Maryland prison system. In surviving one of the longest prison sentences on record anywhere in the world, Ford has always maintained his innocence. When Charlie first came here, the first couple days of being here, he still will walk with his hands behind his back like he shuffled. Actually, it looked like he was running, trolloping with his hands behind his back like that, like he ain't shackles. And I will always come up on side of him and try to redirect him to let him know, you're not in prison, you are free, you're free.
Okay, so I'm just going to go back to the keynote. All right. So in knowing I get the case of Charles Ford taught me a lot about the underpinnings of my learning on pursuing state archives, but also on like questioning what is an archive, right? What it, and what it means to be an abolitionist. So Charlie himself as a person is an archive. The elders all around us are tremendous libraries. And in Charlie's case, I was I was interested in, you know, in just like as a you know, from the perspective of research. I was interested in knowing the argument of the state to keep him locked up because even after 64 years, even after we knew that, you know, that the state had lost all the documents from his trial after, you know, going on seven decades, his trial occurred in 1952 during Jim and Jane Crow. And so we know that, you know, it wasn't a trial at all. And, and, and um, so from a, from a documentary archive perspective, we knew that having access to courtroom recordings would be much more useful than, than transcripts. Uh, th the advantage is that you know, an MP3 file costs much less versus paying for uh, thousands of dollars of transcripts. And uh, something that was happening in Maryland in the aftermath of the popularity of the serial podcast was that judges were obstructing uh, access to courtroom recordings, which which was like, you know, which the public has the right to to order or to have access to. And so uh, we, through the assistance of the Georgetown Law Institute for Constitution, Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, um, I was able to get support through their lawyers to sue uh, Charles County, which was where Charlie's case had taken place. And we got, we, I ended up writing about you know, the landscape of obstruction that was happening by Maryland judges, uh, obscuring journalists and the public's access to, to you know, state allowed access to, to courtroom recordings. And for me, this was like, it was like a very simple process to go through an imposed political state obstacle that, that arised in the process. Because, you know, through the op-ed, I think we upset the attorney general and then they just like, you know, said, here's your recordings and, and go away. But like the one advantage was is that we did change the process in the county. And it was fairly, you know, it was it it, it came without much of a fight. Um so that's like that was I guess my, my first real foreway into freedom of information by way of, of the United States. Also included in the Unger group, so among those 250 lifers that came home, who would have, you know, most of which would otherwise still be in prison, or you know, either dying or fighting for a parole. One of them was uh, is a man by the name of Eddie Conway, a former Panther, a political prisoner who was held for for 44 years, uh, and I had the opportunity to to work with Eddie at the Real News Network out of Baltimore, uh, where, where I, was, I used to intern for a time. Eddie has a, has a show online with Real News, uh, and it's also a tremendous archive called Rattling the Bars. Uh, he just released his latest episode. It's on the 50th anniversary of the, of the murder of George Jackson. So I highly recommend that. Uh, it was through a deeper knowledge of Eddie's story that I also came to learn the inner working the inner workings of the FBI's COINTEL pro program. Uh, Eddie was, you know, he, he was a target of of COINTEL pro uh, at the time uh, when when you know he was being targeted. There was, you know, mass mass surveillance throughout the city of, throughout the city of Baltimore in terms of like, uh, you know, covert covert programs of state surveillance collaborations between the police and the FBI. Uh, for for those who may not know about it, Evan, could you please cue up clip two? Call, this is a film that, that kind of tells the underpinnings about how COINTELPRO got revealed. It's a film called 1971.
I knew that we would find things in that office that were not only immoral, but probably illegal. What we thought of at the time as the war machine, we wanted to do as much damage to it as we could before we got caught. We knew that if we got caught, we were going to probably face very serious prison time. It was very empowering to know that ordinary people could actually take action. Philadelphia was full of young families just like ourselves who were very active politically. I was ready to make a transition from nonviolent protest to nonviolent disruption. They feared there were FBI informers in their midst. We heard someone trying to break into one of the apartments in the building. Somebody yelled back, FBI. Everywhere you went, there was somebody taking your picture. Even the presidents of the United States were afraid of the FBI. If the FBI was suppressing dissent, it was as important to expose that as it was to end the war. So many things were so wrong, there was no decision to be made. You have to do something. Break into an FBI office, remove files, and mail them to newspapers. More than a 1,000 documents were stolen from the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania. They called themselves the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI. These documents reveal illegal activity by the FBI. Surveillance of people engaged in protected First Amendment activity. The fortress was under siege. 150 agents were looking for us. My worry was that what would happen to those three kids? They risk everything. They saw injustice and decided that they were going to act on it. So, okay. Oh, it's on Chanel. All right. So that so that was an example of like how the COINTEL program got exposed. Uh, then you know by 19 that was in 1971 by 19 you know in 19 by 1971 1972 the the black panther party is you know neutralized uh a lot of a lot of trials in you know in all the cities that the chapters are in uh there's you know there was massive infiltration those informants got turned state witness to then incriminate you know in some cases over 20 members at a time so this is all of like a planned strategy between uh, between the like the 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 head the attorney general the federal attorney general of the U.S. collaborating with state's attorneys' offices across the country in addition to the pol police agencies and so on. So this is it's like a, an example of you know we talk about predatory police policing. It's it's literally hunting. And that and that's not a, a an overstatement. You know, this 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 kind of of strategy and, and this language is something that I, that I've come to through the teachings of people like like Joy James and uh, Orasami Burton, where um, you know it's not an overstatement to say that it's a it's a situation of domestic warfare. Um, so as, and and to I guess an example that you know that illustrates this uh, that came to pop culture because of disclosure of the Cohen-Tell Pro Papers is would be the latest film, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, that tells the story of of both infiltration by the FBI in the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party and the murder of, of Fred Hampton. So, Evan, could you pull you up clip three, please? Yeah, third video. Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois Black Panther Party. Repeat after me.
You're looking at 18 months for the stolen car, five years for impersonating a federal officer, or you can go home. The Black Panthers are forming a rainbow coalition of oppressed brothers and sisters of every color. Their aim is to sow hatred and inspire terror. I will learn all that I can. I These ain't no terrorists. You can murder a liberator, but you can't murder liberation. You can murder a revolutionary, but you can't murder a revolution. And you can murder a freedom fighter, but you can't murder freedom. All right. So something, I guess, something that I wanted to bring up with these pop cultural references, or at least the most recent, oh, hang on. What's going on here? There we go. We, there's, I guess a, a delineation that I wanted to introduce around how um, how things that are happening now in relation to COINTELPRO would not happen, right? Without first the exposure of the program, access to the archives where we have, you know, either people accessing them directly from the FBI through freedom of information law or through their transfer to the National Archives and Records Administration where they're where they sit now for um, for historical value and where they're available to, to researchers. It's not a perfect process. Sometimes you need lawsuits to ask to access them in worst case scenarios, but that is the process. And some outcomes that have happened, you know, in recent years are one, you know, just this year, largely in response to community mobilization uh, and political mobilization from from discussions about Judas and the Black Messiah. Bobby Rush, a current congressman and former Panther, has passed a, is proposing a bill for the full public release of COINTEL profiles. In other words, you know, we shouldn't have to waste time going through National Archives and Red, Red, Records Administration. This is something that should be open to the public, uh, you know, without, without going through methods of state censorship. Uh, another uh, another example is Jeff Haas, one of the lawyers of Fred Hansen, uh, who, who's been a, a lawyer of the family for, you know, going on 50 years now, over 50 years. Uh, he's still, there's still lawsuits happening with, with, uh, with Fred Hansen's uh, file, right, with his FBI file to undo censorship because All right, I think we're back. And I'm having a little technical difficulty here. No. For some reason, my mouse is not. Try resharing that again. Okay, you can hear me now. All 
All right. I think we're back now as well. Uh, Chanel or Kevin, do you know where I left off? Like where you last could hear me? You had just been, oh, you had just been discussing, um, sorry, my brain's a little bit all over the place now, but you had just been discussing um, why you were bringing up um, the pop culture reference. Aha, uh -huh. okay. All right. And I'll the lawyer, yeah, Fred Hopkins' lawyer. And, and Jeff Hawks, okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so yeah, like there's still censorship, unjust censorship on this file. And the more that lawyers are pursuing the file, the more that they're seeing, you know, how um, how orders for the literal execution of Panther leaders like Hampton, right, which we can assume also happened with other leaders of Black power groups like Malcolm X, Martin, Medgar Evers, you know, and so on. It, this goes all the way up to executive federal offices like Hoover and even the president in some cases. So I use this as like, as a starting point or as, a, as an American comparison, because given, you know, we have a cultural moral superiority complex in Canada, as though these kinds of problems don't exist here. And, you know, one of the files, the more you look, the more you find how, I guess, how that moral superiority, superiority complex asserts itself. And so this is, you know, one example, like you have a letter from Hoover, where uh, it's, it's from a COINTEL profile that is talking about the Black, black nationalist movement in the, in the international uh, dimensions of the Black Power movement, where we see you know, some recognizable names like in point seven in terms of who's being targeted, Rosie Douglas and Brenda Dick Dickinson Dash, who were uh, you know, one of the protests at the Sir George Williams affair. And one of you know, two, of th there were three people that were imprisoned out of, you know, I think, 97 that were that were arrested. But I think what what is really important in in the, from this letter are like two things. Number one, it's very easy to decipher that the redacted that the redactions, you know, the first one is Royal Canadian Mounted Police, then abbreviated to RCMP, and it it shows the extent of collaboration, right, that is, in, that is occurring in Canada between the, the FBI and how its state surveillance apparatus is, as, is actually a North American state surveillance apparatus uh, where the RCMP is deploying its own version of it. And in some cases, you know, taking the FBI's lead. Um, so, with that, Evan, could you pull up clip four? This is a, an example of, this, or, or this is for viewers that may not be familiar, this is uh, the, the, the film Night Floor, which, uh, which illustrates the, the incident of the 1969 uh, Sir George Williams uh, uprising in Montreal. Let's take a stand now! Let's go! Everybody that believes in justice, take a stand! Don't sit on your asses anymore! Move up there and take a stand! If you white can sit back and have people like O'Brien run you to hell crazy, that's your privilege! We as students feel that we have a right to be heard. As far back as 10 months ago, the black students had laid some charges of racism against a Sir George Williams professor. I suppose in, in, in my, my heart, I figured we'd occupy it and two days later it'd all be resolved and everybody would be happy and we'd be singing Kumbaya. Um, not exactly what happened. It was so fast. It was one of the very first times in my life that I was actually afraid for my life. We were tricked. It was not a victory. People were yelling, burn, nigger, burn. This chanting of let the niggers burn. They wanted us to die. 
That shook me to my core, of course, because that means that there are people around who don't mind seeing other people perish. Okay, so uh, the film Ninth Floor, I guess something that I uh, guess should be prefaced is, uh, you know, 1968, April 1968 is like a turning point in terms of uprising, much like George Floyd was a turning point for uprising last year. Uh, you had the murder of Martin Luther King in April and uh, with a lot of mobilization by, by activists, organizations, both you know around the world. And given that you had uh, Panther movement and Panther leaders that were very internationalist, right? Social internationalist. Uh, you had people like Sto Stokely, Mark, Stokely Carmichael coming to uh, Montreal in 1968 in, in, the, in the fall for the famous Black Writers Conference. And so uh, I want to play a clip now to show the extents of like the RCMP's um, surveillance apparatus, how they were, uh, you know, deploying on and targeting black activists, black leaders, and also, you know, this is also during a time period of the Aboriginal uh, Indian movement. The aim, right? They're 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 in equal measure. They're also targeting them as well. Uh, so if you could play, I guess we're on clip five now. This is really to to like profile, uh, uh, you know, one of the lead targets of the movement in Canada, which was which was Rosie Douglas. I would have thought to plead guilty to something that I thought I was not guilty of to be unprincipled at that time. Rosie was a um, larger than life character. He was very brilliant. I don't think he was at St. George at the time. I think he was at McGill. But he supported us thoroughly. You displayed it right here that this institution is racist. And in the highest institution of decision making here, your parliament displayed it. Roosevelt Douglas, who was involved in the black students' movement, gained national publicity for his part in the sit in. Since his release from jail last year, he's made a full-time career as a militant black power advocate. I am a fighter for liberation. I'm one who believes that my country has the capacity to, to produce and provide all our people with a decent standard of living. And to do that, there have to be certain basic structural changes. I think Rosie Douglas was the only one who persisted in trying to stretch out the political mileage of that whole thing. They say Rosie Douglas is a threat to national security. Uh, his whole life he felt he was under surveillance. Was it a reality that we were infiltrated? Yes, that much was proven. Was it a, a, a reality that so-called leaders were um, under surveillance? Yes, that was confirmed. There was some dramatic testimony today before the McDonald Commission into the RCMP. It came from an American named Warren Hart, who says that for four years he worked as an agent in Canada and other countries. His job was to infiltrate radical groups like the Black Panthers. Roosevelt Rosie Douglas was to be Hart's chief target. Today, Hart testified that he had been told to break the law to get information. He opened mail, broke into buildings, and secretly taped Douglas's conversations. His orders, he said, came from the Mounties directly. All right. So this is the, I guess, the last, you know, kind of the conclusion of Ninth Floor is a, it's kind of almost a, you know, like, like a celebration. It's, it ends in almost celebratory fashion, right? Like what was the struggle 
four, and it talks about the establishment of ombudsman offices uh, to deal with human rights place in Canadian universities and a celebration of Canada's official multicultural multiculturalism policy. And I would say that, you know, it, this really speaks to the, I guess, the political consciousness or lack of political consciousness of the framework of Ninth Floor that I think is has been under critiqued in in discussions of documentary in in discussions of even you know historical discussions of the event because you know that that last clip that we saw when we talked about the surveillance of Rosie Douglas um, you know following his criminalization at Sir George where he was you know, as a, as a protester was targeted, you know, something that the, that the, that the, that the film doesn't go into is, is how early on during the protest that the RCMP had informant within the group of poor protesters themselves, right? And, and how, you know, how they themselves may have been, the, how the police may have been involved in starting the fire on the ninth floor. Um, so all of these kinds of things are uncritiqued or under critiqued in, in the film as a whole. Because then when we look at the aftermath, right, we see that the end game for Rosie Douglas is deportation on a, on a sec security certificate, right? And this is ordered in 1972. It's very important that we pay attention to the date. October 1972. This is like the government, what, what is untold in the film and, and it is what, what I think what is undertold in the story of deportation or targeting, right? Or the hunting of Rosie Douglas by the RCMP is that, you know, had they issued the deportation or in, in November, it would have been too late. Why? Because it would have been five years that Rosie would have been in Canada and thus would have secured permanent residency status and you can't deport somebody with status. So, you know, this is one of the one of the I would say the most contemporary popular uses of security certificates uh, in the black in the Black Power era. But where now, you know, we see the use of security certificates being deployed in the post 9/11 era against you know against mostly Muslim men who are suspected of being terrorists. Right, so this is how the security state is is constantly reinventing itself. But of course, you know, nine, ninth floor doesn't really do the work to to speak to to how deep the security status run runs and how um, the level of collaboration that uh, that the Canadian that the Canadian security apparatus has with um, has with the has with the, with the U.S. apparatus, an example being, you know, like it was briefly named the, the the FBI agent that was targeted or that was attached to Rosie uh, after you know after he got out of jail and and after the deportation order was issued was an agent by Warren Hart. It's no co coincidence that like that Warren Hart was one of the founding members of the Baltimore chapter of the Black Panther Party and was also complicit. In the uh, in the conviction of Eddie Conway, who I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, this is also you know has this is also like this kind of circular information or access to this knowledge. It's 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 I find it you know I'm I was astounded, but I'm not so much anymore that I had to come to the Canadian version of the story by way of Baltimore, right? By way of Eddie, because you know, I think that it really speaks to how the degree to which, again, moral superiority and how the Canadian state omits and erases. So, uh, through the work of previous scholars like like Steve Hewitt, who have written books that I'll reference in a second, uh, this is a, an example of of a previous ATIP release uh, from, 
from CSIS in the 90s when Steve Hewitt was writing his book, uh, Spying 101. And so you can see here, uh, the, the dates of the of the Sir George Williams affair happened between the 29th of January, 1969 to February 10th, 1969. And so, you can see how on the left where it says report number two, this is like a play by play of what's going on by the RCMP uh, Special in Investigations Bureau in Montreal to, um, to, to Ottawa, but where the play by play is being dictated by an informant on the floor. So I think that, you know, the story that that is under told because even you know, I went to the 50th anniversary uh, protest and pedagogy conference for the 50th anniversary of Mr. George Williams conference. And there was still a lot of speculation, you know, on how infiltration happened, who it was, but it's like, this needs to be a, a more, I, I think a more uh, discussed part of the narrative of what happened at St. George, right? And, and so on the left, uh, that the date of that, or on the right, sorry, the date of that document is, is March 3rd. Um, and, and it's a, it's, it's another report, you know, in the aftermath in, in March that kind of, that summarizes the whole, the whole event. But I think, you know, what's at play here, or, you know, a story that's still to be told from the archive, should people get access to more of them, is the state of, state sabotage and, and you know, uh, criminalization, so on, that, that the RCMP was engaged, that the RCMP was engaged in. Some of that did come out, of course, during the McDonald Commission. Uh, you know, this happened not only to uh, Black and Indigenous groups, but like, you know, we, when we talk about October 1970 uh, in the October crisis, that's kind of where the uh, the supreme uh, powers that are given to the RCMP really start, and how you know they they really they really don't want to rel relinquish those powers, and so over the course of a decade, you know that you have you have an explosion, right, of of the state apparatus and 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 and, and surveillance apparatus imploring violence on on civilians um and and so you know the end outcome of that of course is the creation of CSIS, the the the, the powers of surveillance and intelligence are, are taken away sorry the, the powers of intelligence are taken away from rcmp and given to CSIS. um so i guess a reason in in some of our research as to why you know, access to information from Canadian institutions, be it CSIS or library archives, or, you know, anything to do with the carceral state, prisons, um, the military, and so on. Uh, it, I thought a good starting point would be to, to think about like how the information is viewed by the state itself and what is its relationship to the citizenry. So, in the, this is from, uh, this was written by a, a fellow by the name of David Eaves. Uh, he's a professor at the Kennedy School of Government right now. He was deeply involved in the Open Canada uh, policy at the turn of the, at around 2010 when it was created. And he makes this distinguishment uh, where, you know, the US, US government documents and US government data is quite literally the people's data. Um, uh, if I go down, you know, there's a legal requirement that any document created by the states uh, is by the United States government is to, be, is to be published in the document domain. So literally, it's like when you think about freedom of information, there is a language of, you know, unobstructed literal rights to that information, that that information is, is the people's information. And he makes a, a distinguishment. Uh, from Canadian state information, which is quite different. And it has to do with the notion of sovereignty. The country never deviated from the European context uh, and where sovereignty in Canada does not lie with the people, it resides 
in King George III's descendant, the present day queen. So it's not the people's data, it's the queen's data, which means that, it's that their discretion and censorship specifically, you know, what, what gets how, what gets released and how it gets censored, I guess is a very simple way to put it. Um, so that's at, if you want to read more about that, ease.ca. Now, like given of, you know, the, the obstacles that brings up, there has been some innovate, when we look back to like how, um, how researchers have found ways around these kinds of obstacles, you know, around increased censorship specifically, or obstacles to access. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to David Mackay, who early on in the 90s and in the 2000s uh, created this system called the Coordination of Access to Information Request System, CARES. Basically, uh, the government would, would produce a summary report of all uh, access to information requests, and it would be pulled from the Treasury Board, and then he would populate a database because it's quite often more efficient to go to access people's uh, completed access to information requests. You know, it's like you're a researcher, you're not the first one to research the subject. How about I go look back and see what kind of research on archives have already been done before? And so you would think that there's an efficient process of, of government agencies opening up archives that current researchers can go back to and ask it's based on the labor of previous research and you know, censorship by the state. Unfortunately, since the era of Open Canada and over the past 20 years, as more information from say the 1950s onwards has become uh, more his, of, of like historical classification than operational classification, we have, um, I would say like a lot more obstacles to and, and like obscure policy in order to get access. So an example would be the care system no longer exists. Why? Because I think it was in 2009, 2010, uh, maybe even earlier, the treasury board just stopped producing these summary documents from each agency. So in other words, David could, you know, the, the whatever script he wrote to populate a database where, where the public could access those summaries of previously processed requests, they, it was impossible because there was no more summary data being produced. A US example of, you know, a current kind of hack around freedom of information is Muckrock. Uh, this is a, a website where that is populated by previously pro process public records requests that that is centralized so it just like as a researcher trying to embark on a starting point of of requests that are that have already been made and research that archives that are already, already available this is a pretty efficient tool um, that, that i've used to look at say for example previous released COINTELPRO documents there is no right now as far i mean to my knowledge there's no Canadian version of this, which like begs the question, how do we as research community or, or maybe, you know, there, I'm sure there are people working on one, you know, how do we make one and, and you know, how do we make that happen? Uh, to look at previous uh, ATIP requests, you know, this has been, you know, this is like a brief selection of of you know books on my shelf of that I've pulled frequently, I'm in deep uh, gratitude and admiration to these to these scholars, uh, where you know you're able to like as you read through their the literature, you come across the previous eight of requests that they've done right to produce these works, but you know a huge obstacle that's come up since Open Canada has been released, and this happens you know say. I'll take a, I'll take a, uh, a, an access request that David Austin did for his book in Fear of a Black Nation, go back to library archives or go back to CSIS and say, you know, can I have access to this? But because the request is more than two years old, 
they they pretend that the request never happened, right? Or that it's that it's like that it's just been lost. In other words, like there it, over the past twenty years, there has been a complete uh, demolition of efficient archiving processes for previously processed ATIP requests. So this has made accessing archives that much more um, that much more problematic. Uh, I think so. In a, so, an example of how I go, I wanted to just like give an example, I guess, on, on how I go about confronting these kinds of issues. So, in a, in CSIS, for example, normally in a in a when you're making an access information request, I try and like talk to somebody on the other line and you know, mediate my quest in a way where it's a conversation. So, so that way, when I'm right, putting pen, pen to paper or you know, framing the scope of my request, that there is a way to do it so that, like, so that you're using the knowledge systems that exist within the agency. So that way, you know, if there's a way to access what you need, there's an efficient way of doing so. But this like, requires talking to somebody uh, on the other on the other end of the line. If you go through, so this is a, a, a website, it's like an index of all access to information and privacy coordinators in every single federal agency. Of course, when it comes to CSIS, there is no name. And when you call those numbers, nobody picks up. When you email them, sometimes you get a response, but like, because it's by email, the, the level of honesty, I would say, in which they're willing to engage with you on, on whether you're going to find what you're looking for is, you know, I would say, obscured. Um, you know, and, and I think that this is really exemplary of the power of CSIS itself, or it's like exemplary privilege over ATIP law, right? Because in, the, in many ways, you know, if I, an example would be if, if we look at how, you know, in the past five years, right, something that the Black Lives Matter movement has produced has a redeployment of the FBI's surveillance of, of like community leaders in Black communities across the United States and probably abroad. Only now they turn them Black identity extremists. We know this because of leaks that have happened from the FBI itself. So in other words, it's like, a total reinvention of COINTELPRO itself. And so I, I wanted to see if CSIS was doing a similar thing. But of course, because of um, Section 15, I think it is, of the Access to Information Law, you know, you, you see, they are not allowed to tell you who they're spying on. So, so the, the only way that you could get access to that information in Canada is from a leak within CSIS itself. So in other words, Section 15 as like a uh, as a method of censoring, you know, whether 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 you want to know whether CSIS is spying on you, it's bulletproof. You can't find that out. Um, but like a way of mediating, to, a way of mediation to like find other things out, right? Because CSIS, it's not like all the information that CSIS holds is exempt. This is one way, I think, in which. They try to make, you know, much of their uh, much of their contemporary archives and even historicalized archives bulletproof. This is a an article that I came across recently. Uh, it, it was recommended to me through uh, conversation with with colleagues who are lawyers, and it has to do with the idea of administrative sabotage. And it, this particular article speaks to uh, agencies in Ontario, like the Ontario Human Rights Tr Tribunal, um, other kinds of housing tribunal, you could say the housing tribunal as well falls under this category, where because of a lack of funding, right, that the government is well aware of, it continue and it, it perpetually deprives this system, you have, you know, years before you can have resolution of people's claims. 
And I think that there is a parallel to be had when it comes to access to information systems in Canada, especially, you know, at the level of the Office of the Information Commissioner, where, uh, you, you, you know, you have a, an administrative layer where you just say, uh, you know, Library Archives says that, you know, a request is going to take a year to get back, or even they might even take a year themselves to reply. Um, you know, you have no recourse. You have to wait, or you have to file an appeal to the Office of the Information Commissioner, almost in like this parental role, where you don't have, even though you may know the law better than people at the Office of the Information Commissioner, you have to wait for for this administrative. Um, not a tribunal, but like body to to take the role and and see if the agency violated the law on on your behalf. But you yourself have to treat it like a lawyer because you have to make your claim right to the information commissioner. So it is it becomes this kind of in, in administrative sabotage where uh, you know not only the our archivists at Library Archives Canada malresource understaffed, you know. Are, are having to manage a, a volume of archive for the entire social science history of Canada, but where there is no investment, right, to, to make it that. And at, the end of, at, and at the end of the day, we're stuck in this situation of administrative sab sabotage, both at the level of the archive and then at the level of, at, of administrative law. Um, yeah, so this is the, the, the poor, I, I kind of like juxtaposed here two things. On the top is, uh, you know, a snapshot of the access to information portal. This is where you go and like search summaries of completed access to information requests. But of course, like if I am, you know, looking at David Mackay's website of a more you know, historically accurate interpretation of what exists in in the archive of completed access to information requests. This is an example of something that comes up in 19, from 1989. I have the previous request number, that's 890107. That's from CSIS. And somebody is requesting a copy of the report, Black Nationalism and Black Extremism in Canada, published in 1972, right? At the same time that, that Trudeau is starting his multiculturalism policy. And, you know, you go to CSIS and they say, the response is, we don't have anything. You have to go to library archives, we transferred everything there. And you go to library archives and, and there is no certainty that they, that they can find this document. To date, you know, my, my uh, access request has been unresponded to largely because of COVID, but um, but that's like you know th this is an example of a document that has previously been released to the public. Yet, even though it's a public document, where labor tax dollars have previously paid for its police for for its release, it's as though this has never happened, and now we have to start over digging through a you know a pile that is 30 years larger. Um, I just wanted to check on time here, 3.30. I have, uh, I have, I guess, oh, there's my mouse here. A couple more examples. I just wanted to check. Yeah, so, I want to just go through a couple examples of um, of like how to look at video archives within both uh, the National Film Board and uh, Library Archives Canada. So, in let's see here. going to share my screen for a moment. So if we go again to start with an American example briefly, if we go to 
take an example like Attica, right? Where that it's it's Attica's 50th anniversary. Um, there is uh, you know a public commission that occurred on Attica. You can go to the New York State Archives in Attica, New York. This is an ex excerpt from their website, and you will get a um, like you can send them a USB, and they will send you all of the state video that was taken during the Attica uprising. And they consider it public because there was the McKay, the McKay Commission. All of this video was 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 put in the public domain. Uh, if you could play, I think it's clip six, Evan. It it it's called Evidence on the Evidence. This is a an archival film that was made entirely from from this archive in New York State Archives. Evan, you there? Video six, yeah. This is evidence gathered at the Attica prison facility. This is the evidence being unloaded and photographed for evidence purposes and eventually destroyed. And I just have a couple more slides. So this is um, this is a National Film Board of Canada database that is, I think, also under very much underrated. Usually, when you go to the NFP website, you get like the the user friendly website with all the the pizzazz of films that you can access and and rent off their site. But if you go to this version of the site, right, you can search by films by topic, film, like their entire collection that goes back to the to the 30s and 40s, right? Where we're literally talking when the National Film Board was a propaganda institution for the government of Canada. Because these films are, much of them are over 50 years old, you do have the right to file an ATIP request for them, even though they're still, um, you know, they're still on film and undigitized. I went through this process to get access to a collection of correctional training videos once that, uh, that, uh, that the state made, uh, I guess it was the Department of Penitentiary, the Department of Justice made them during the 60s. Uh, Evan, if you could quickly play quick seven, or clip seven, this is an example of, of that. It's a quick one minute clip.
Smith, 15 years behind bars is out of the question. His only thought, escape. Every minute of his time will be spent looking for weaknesses. So, there we go. So this is, that was an example of, I think, you know, a small excerpt of what was like, I think it was a six or seven part series of correctional training videos that were all dramatized, made in the 60s, that the government of Canada actually sold to other pen Western penitentiary systems around the world. And, uh, and you know, to get access to, to these things that were, just sitting in vaults doing nothing at this time. Uh, I had to sit in a room with a lawyer, with the ATIP coordinator of the National Film Board, not my lawyer, their lawyer, and where I wasn't allowed to take notes because nobody had seen these in decades. And, and so, you know, they, they, they in, in, in effect, you know, for the cost of putting it on the reel and, and, and watching them, before deciding whether I wanted to proceed with digitization or not, uh, they had to set, they had to see whether was whether there was like any threat to national security on these reels. So I think I had one more example about uh, the, uh, the the Prison for Women uh, Commission that happened in 1994, but we're we're coming up on on, on it's only 20 minutes on was it 3:40 here, so 2:40 your time. So I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll open it up with the discussion with, with Chanel and Kevin. Thank you very much, Andy. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks so much for your presentation and thanks for doing the investigative work that you do in so many mediums. Maybe I'll ask Chanel, do, do you have any questions that you want to, to lead off with? Yeah, yeah, I'd also like to thank you for everything you just shared. I find that the more tabs I have open after a conversation, the more I'm going to be learning afterwards, which is something that's really important. So thank you for everything you just shared with us. Something that really stood out, and I haven't formulated the words how I would like, but something that really stood out is just like, what I'm understanding is that like, archives are a stamp in, in time that move forward with us. And what we're stamping are like the experiences and and the... I don't want to call it passion. Yeah, the, the experiences of people who were were existing and are still existing. And so it's ongoing. So like archives don't, aren't just something that are of the past. We're continually creating archives for ourselves and for future generations to be able to explore. And so you yourself are doing that. So like, thank you very much. But also like how, what is leading you? How, how are you finding yourself to be creating these connections with folks who had mentioned Baltimore brought you to the um, Sir George Williams uprising. Like, how how are you creating these connections that are taking you around to create these archives for us, for everyone? Yeah, I, thank you for asking that, Chanel. I mean, I would say, you know, my prior to you know working in spaces of of like media creation of spaces of you know political work, community work. Uh, I, used to, I used to work in uh, international health and, and, and that, you know, I started in an early career of, um, of foreign policy. I used to work at, even at, at foreign affairs. I think that probably one of the, the I guess one of the marking points of, of my life was, was working in Kandahar as, as a sub subcontractor of CETA doing aid work right, in 2007, 2008. And so when you, so my entryway to this in terms of, you know, my own political consciousness and my own connection to community would be through anti-war work, right? That, that's kind of my, uh, my, my start. But then, you know, what brought what brought me to Baltimore would have been like other kind, were, were, would have been collegial connections of like people, 
former working relationships from previous NGOs, work, you know, working for different uh, other or international organizations, but, but also becoming more literate to the kinds of domestic warfare that is happening all around us all the time. So, and, and trying to, you know, understand my own skills within this domain and, and how to, to lend those to, to other communities should I, should I be invited to do so. And that, you know, when I, when I went to, to that Sir George conference, that, that happened to be through, you know, a conversation with, with people like David Austin. Sometimes it's through like other scholars. Sometimes it's through, you know, people doing, doing common research work. Other times it's through like other filmmakers or other people doing similar kind of anti-violence community organizing and so on. So there's different ways of, of being relationship and in doing this labor that, that of course has like nothing to do with filmmaking, right? Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate the way that like you say that you're lending your skill because that really, that it's what it is, right? Filmmaking, and perhaps you want to elaborate on this, but filmmaking is, it's one way of creating access for others to be able to learn alongside or learn from or learn with. And so um, maybe if I can just ask one more question, like there are so, with so many ways to be able to share knowledge with others, like what is, why filmmaking for you? What is it about filmmaking for you that, like how are the two merging? I think initially, initially it was through, you know, so often the space of nonfiction can be dominated by the search of truth and fact, right? And through, you know, and then once you see the spell, right, the mainstream media is how it and how that spell is cast upon people that that then you know, using tools of speaking truth, truth to power is like a common way of, of getting into to that kind of labor. But something that I've also learned, I would say, over the past 10 years, is how unnecessary speaking truth to power is to, uh, to know, right? Like, like tools of cinema and tools of media are and like basically the whole presentation that I just gave is, I made note of this because I thought it was really cool to say. Um, it's like, it's neither sufficient nor necessary to know something, right? That, or to offer proof of what is already known. Like when you look, when we're talking about the enslavement of indigenous and black people in Canada through acknowledgement of emancipation day, for example, or the murder of children in residential schools as a part of broader genocide or how predatory policing protects the whiteness of the so social order and private property or the lies of the government on matters of Afghanistan. You know, we don't need state archives to know this stuff or commissions of inquiry to prove this and so on. Because like basically that search of proof or that search of truth is always to like prove something. And this is what goes back to the the distraction that Toni Morrison talk, talks about. It's like we, we get embedded in the distraction of what people already know anyway. There's other technologies. There's other, there's other ways of, uh, there's other knowledge systems that are more valuable to doing life affirming work, to building the society that we want to see in the world. And, so, and none of this has to do with filmmaking, right? Maybe it's, it's, it's to building those other kinds of technologies and knowledge systems that, that you know, that, that I've mentioned, but that's, that's how I come to see filmmaking now is that there's much more important things to be doing in the world. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I don't want to hog the floor, Kevin. So you jump in and I'll jump in after if we don't do audience right away. I was going to ask one question. Um, do, do you see the work that you do as a kind of guerrilla archiving. Uh, you're working with formal archives, but you're also collecting all these stories and accounts and images from multiple different uh, sites and you're making them available to people in ways that otherwise uh, wouldn't be. So does that term resonate with you at all, guerrilla archiving? 
Not really. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I think that I'm, because I would say my, my knowledge and interaction with what we see as like formal institutional archives is still very early, right? And, and I'm still learning, you know, through, through books like, you know, that have come out from this center, Kevin, it's been like tremendously uh, helpful to learn of, of the scholarship and work of, of researchers before me. Um, but I think that, you know, an example would be with COVID, right? With COVID complaints, all these COVID surveillance lines that, that, that sprung up, you know, finding a way to access those those complaints, right? Like those those actual calls, or you know how your local city is, what they're doing with this information, how, the kinds of collaborations that they're fostering with the police. You know, once I had access to those to, to those records, I think it's really important to to foster a relationship with and collaborate with people that are doing similar work. You're not you're not the this is not a you know, it, this isn't hero ball, like to, to use like a basketball analogy. So there, there's like a great, there was a great project that I forged a relationship with called Policing the, the Pandemic, um, who, who was doing similar kind of work tracking how, um, how governments in Ontario and across Canada are, are using COVID as an opportunity to expand law enforcement systems in domains of public health. So, and it's that relationship because this is public health information that somebody like me then can say, okay, well, there's like a clause here that you need to give this information to the public for free. So, you know, developing relationships with uh, institutions, with, with researchers doing similar work to fight, to try and find ways to build strategies uh, where, where this kind of information that can then be translated to activism, um, hot new policies, to building uh, a better world, or to just like dismantle this, these systems of sabotage that, that seem to be of, of, of a perpetual nature in, in, the, in the concurrent you know, settler society that we live in. Uh, that's, that's the kind of way that I see my labor being of use, whether that's guerrilla or, or not, I, I guess depends from, you know, the seat where, the kind of labor that you're doing too. Maybe I'll take one question from the Q&A before I turn it back over to Chanel. Uh, question from Tom Naismith from Archival Studies at University of Manitoba. You show clearly the state's historical role in surveillance, but is the larger problem now surveillance by commercial entities in big tech? If so, does the state now have a crucial role as perhaps our only tool pre to prevent abuses of corporate surveillance? If so, how can we ensure the state plays that role effectively? Hmm. No, I think that this is an important question because like it's because my question is or, or a question, a, a parallel question that I have to that is not to think of corporate surveillance as the same, but how these are, how state surveillance and corporate surveillance are bedfellows and how we're living in an age of the reverse panopticon, right? How, how we're all like walking versions of COINTELPRO with in the age in the age that we live in, so you know, an example would be, of this would be Amazon, like a company like Amazon, turning its inf information gathering capacity, where like let's manufacture a thread of porch pirates on our porch and put cameras on our porch, and then forge allegiances or partnerships with local police departments, where they then have access to that data and that kind of footage. I think that you know, is 
is that impulse coming from Amazon to, to you know, increase revenue uh, from selling fear? Yeah, but then so is its in, impulse to forge partnerships with, you know, state security agencies like the police to, to, to boost revenue then, but then it's also in the police interest because then they can also manufacture and sell fear and have, you know, a more expansive um, tools at their uh, tools at their disposal for surveillance as well. So I think that like the impulse isn't isn't one way; it's actually complementary. I think a lot of your work that you've discussed, or yeah, like the ideas that you hold and carry into your work and the communities that you're working with, um, don't like wouldn't fear people. But have you found that um, bodies that you want to work with, like various, if you're if you're creating a pitch, let's say, have you found that um, those bodies, like those or collectives or organizations, have themselves been a little bit fearful of collaborating or or showcasing the work that you are producing or like how do, how do you work with that is something that comes to mind i think so is the is the question for example like how would i how do i work with communities that i may not be a, a part of right is that no or, not so much uh, that so when you're or, if with your fellowship or with um like various film organizations have you ever found there's been a resistance to showcasing your work or um if you've made a proposal that they've come back to you with, oh, we can't show this. Like oh, there's yeah. a little bit of fear in that. Um, I think that like, it depends on, it depends on the venue. Like I would say, you know, when, when I first started, you know, the very first documentary that I made was about my experience in Kandahar and how the experience of Afghan life the experience of like Canadians' relationship with life in Afghanistan in like in in the mid two thousands, right when the military mission was was just accelerating, that the, the soldier became like this prop through which the CBC, through which media, you know, and it hasn't changed much, but but that that it was through you know, the white male soldier through which we learned everything there is to know about Afghanistan while they are murdering people in some instances or sending people to, t to torture chambers and so on. So I saw like, I, that, that was like part of, of you know, part of a story that I wanted to tell was how this war was about the reinvention of the role of the military in Canadian society from go since and, and had never had anything to do with the sake of Afghans. And and when I pitched this to like a CBC program, they would often, you know, come come with pushback like, well, uh, you know, we need to get you can't just make these accusations. You can't, you we we need to get the other side. And I think that, you know, over the past decade even we're, we're kind of criticizing journalism more where there you know there is no other side or the other side doesn't discount the experience of an individual right so yeah i think that i think you're always going to come up against those kinds of um that kind of opposition but it's but it's also about like where can i best place this communication tool in a forum with people where it can produce productive discussions instead of just dismissive discussion. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm yeah. entirely grateful that you're creating these discussions and that we're having one here today. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chanel. Um, one, one other question I had, um, is Unless Chanel, did you have any other questions that you wanted to put out there? If I did, we'd be going into more hours. So we'll connect again, Andrea. Um, can you say a little bit, Andy, on uh, 
you, your approach as a filmmaker, uh, when you're making documentaries, uh, some of the clips that you showed of, of other films, they were very realist. Other, other clips, they seemed almost kind of fictionalized or there was like an element of verisimilitude with them. Your own style, what's your approach? And where do you situate yourself in that landscape of like realism versus verisimilitude? Well, um, could we end with like a um, bit and a half clip of the sample of contact so I can show you rather than tell you? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. All right, so Evan, do you want to play clip eight? A person gets out of prison untreated. There are more victims involved here. Uh, Therese mentioned the uh, trailer visit program because the trailer visit program is the greatest tool for treatment and rehabilitation, keeping a family together. My dream would be to get the contact show national for its sociological values, to make those kind of changes in society that I feel are necessary. There are needles in prison and those needles in prison are causing AIDS daily. What are we, and I say we, that's me and you, what are we gonna do about it? It's the people outside that gotta do this. We gotta solve the problem, we gotta do this. I'm we not saying, hey, we, hey. We're not treated well in the prisons. Call her, call her. It's costing me probably half of my tax dollars every week is going towards the prison system. Caller, let me country. stop you for one second here. I don't expect you, the public, and you're speaking for the majority of the public, I don't expect you, the public, to come up with the answers. I expect you, the public, to listen. I expect the guys in the prison to speak and, say, and, and also listen. I expect penologists and sociologists to speak and listen. And while everybody's dialoguing and listening to everybody, we may come up with a solution to this problem. You want to know something, Rick? Yep. I did not, okay? This is how, how much they played with my mind. Mm -hmm. I did not know what went on that night until I seen the video again, and it happened to me. that's a, a project that I'm currently working on using where I have like this open, I guess, artistic question of like, how can I tell a story about the carceral state, the prison system, but what through to or like, through archives of prisoners speaking for themselves. So in this case, um, and I'm actually trying, people held captive by the state speaking for themselves. I'm trying to, you know, dissuade from using language of treating people in prisons as objects. So I, I'm correcting myself there. But like, you know, it in to answer your question, Kevin, like every project is presents its own artistic challenges. So like there's never there's never a formula. In this case, you know, I definitely have a, I think a creative mandate to uh, allow people to experience a television show where unless you lived in Kingston from 1994 to 1998 and watched the, the local cable channel, you would have never seen this very, what is today a very surreal show of, which is like a live talk TV show of people held captive in local prison who are allowed to uh, have cameras, who are allowed to do local community reporting, and then come back and congregate at the local community cable station, 
to have what in effect is a public comment on a discussion of not just the justice system, but the world we live in. While correctional guard, guards called in, uh, police officers called in, people from local prisons called in. So yeah, that's like, sorry for not, the, for not doing a proper setup of that clip, but that's looking at both like events like contact, it, and other kinds of contemporary media that do the same kind of work, right? That, re that remove the journalism, that try and provoke a greater public interaction with, with, with people who are, who are incarcerated. That's, that's kind of the, the work that the next project is trying to do. Well, thank, thank you again so much for sharing your work with us today and sharing your insights and contrasting US and Canadian uh, obfuscation or secrecy systems. Uh, thank you, Chanel, for, for being here. Uh, and, and Evan, too, for, for making it all work. Any, any last words, Chanel, or any last words, Andy? Uh, if anybody uh, has any follow-up questions, or they can reach me, uh, can reach me by email, uh, Andrea at andreaconte.org. Thank you so much for everything you shared with us, and I'm, I'm so wholly looking forward to seeing what else you create and share with us, and being in touch. Best of luck at law school. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, with all of this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for all the work that you do. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.